Hello, everybody. I'm here with a very special guest, Jessa Thurman, who's here in Arkansas, all the way from Australia. And she's an entomologist who just released her new book, Australia's Incredible Insects. And if you're wondering why we're having a program with someone who is all the way from Australia, it's because Hot Springs used to actually be her home. She was a former employee here at the library and a schoolmate of mine, Go Trojans. So Jessa, I'm happy to have you here for this program tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you for everyone who's tuning in. Um, I don't know if you can go ahead and, do I go yeah. ahead and share my screen or no? Well, well I was gonna say, um, I chose to wear something a little tropical tonight. And do you think this shirt is gonna attract any insects? Oh, maybe, maybe some butterflies. Yeah, you got the right color signals in there if you stand in the sun. You look, look like a flower. I don't know if you smell like a flower, though. <laughs> I, I don't know either. But so in, in tonight's program, Jessa is going to highlight and educate uh, some of her favorite insects found in Australia, as well as here in Arkansas. So we'll get to see a nice comparison between the two. And after that, we're going to talk about more insects and her writing process and answer any questions you viewers might have. And in fact, we're going to give away a signed copy of her new book to one lucky winner signed right there it looks like it was printed as part of the book great signature jessa but um, yeah all you have to do for a chance to win this is ask Jessa a question and you'll have a chance to win but uh, we'll get to that later and for now i'm gonna turn it over to you thank you right um so i had the great privilege to write a book which has just come out earlier this year and it's on australia's insects even though i am from arkansas i've lived in australia for a few years now and throughout that time i've i've spent all that time learning about insects and uh, i actually moved to australia because i knew the insects were quite special so before I begin my uh, presentation, I'd like to acknowledge country. So I acknowledge the, the traditional custodians of the lands on which I'm presenting today and of uh, the lands on which many of my photos have been taken from. And I pay my respects to their ancestors, past, present, and emerging. And of course, extend that respect to any indigenous peoples that are tuning in here today. So as Paul mentioned, I'm from Hot Springs, Arkansas, and I spent my high school and my college years um, working in the children's department here at the wonderful Garland County Library. I'm sure all of you know how wonderful this library is, but it was um, pretty extraordinary to work here. And I loved getting to work with all these wonderful people and getting to engage in programs. So you'll see um, in this photo, I have a large uh, python wrapped around me. Pythons kill by constriction, um, not by venom, but maybe still nervous seeing it wrapped around me. It was totally friendly. And that was all for a, a, one of the many programs that we did here um, at, the, at the library. And this python, I thought it was quite funny, is actually an Australian black-headed python. Um, so that's something that you'd be quite lucky to see out in the desert in Australia, um, but I got to see it in Arkansas first. Um, and so throughout the many years that I worked here at the library, there's lots of great lessons I had and I was very nurtured here um, in terms of my development, but I, there was a couple of key lessons that I took away from this experience, which I, I later used when I put together my book. And so one of those first key lessons was to never underestimate the intelligence of a child. So I'd be shelving books and I'd overhear conversations uh, with adults and their, their kids saying, oh, that book's too big for you or um, that's too hard for you. But the kids want to try. And so I think it's always so important to let them try. And so there is plenty of examples where kids were allowed to try. And um, when they're given the information, it may be intimidating at first. But if you just try to explain it, they're ready to learn. And the other key lesson is that juvenile nonfiction books are useful to a very broad audience. So I worked in the children's department and we'd often have grown-ups come over and they're interested in learning about a subject. And uh, they found the, the books in the adult section quite difficult to read. You kind of needed to have a degree in that subject to understand some of the content in the book. But in the juvenile section, the books were a great introduction to a subject that you're interested in, so a great place for you to get started on. 
And so that's what I kept in mind when I had the opportunity to put together uh, a, a juvenile nonfiction book on insects. So um, kind of overlapping with my library years, I went to college here in Arkansas as well. And that was at Hendricks College, which is a liberal arts school. So I went um, originally to study English and writing. That was what I was good at in high school and what I enjoyed. Um, but thankfully that uh, college made me take a natural history course. I had to get a science credit um, to be a whole person, uh, which is how you get your liberal arts degree from uh, this university. And the professor teaching that natural history course was Dr. Maureen McClung. And you can see her in this photo holding a bird, um, her beloved bird. Um, and her passion really shone through um, in this course. So she's mainly interested in ornithology, the study of birds, but she taught us about um, botany, plants, um, geology. Um, we got to look for fossils. Um, and we also had to do an insect collection. And I was like, oh my goodness, when I took this course, what am I doing with my life? I need to change my major. And I slowly but surely did. And there's many opportunities that I found at Hendricks, but one of them was the opportunity to do an internship program. And I shot for the sky and I applied for um, an internship at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. Got funding to go live out there from my school and got to look at insects for 40 hours a week over the summer. And that was fantastic because one, it was testing my interest. I like insects, I like entomology. Will I still like it after 40 hours a week? The answer to that was yes. But then the other opportunity was that I got to work with entomologists and expand my knowledge and learn a lot more than I could ever learn um, at Hendrix, which has many resources, but it was kind of limited in some ways. Um, and, and the other thing that I got to do once I finished my degree at Hendrix, I was eligible to apply for a fellowship um, from the Watson Foundation. So this Watson Fellowship, um, it doesn't sound real, but it essentially allows you to pursue a project of your design for one year, and you can go to any country in the world. But in the countries that you visit during that year, you cannot have been there before. You cannot be with people you knew before that year started. And, um, and there's a few other rules, but that's, that's the basic gist of it. And so with my Watson Fellowship, it allowed me, just applying for that allowed me to dream about where I would go and what I would do. And um, I wanted to study insects in different applications of entomology around the world. And one of those places was Australia. So that's how I first came to Australia. And I was there for three months and I thought, how was I born so far away from this place? It was extraordinarily beautiful. I had made so many friends and I was I was crying when I had to leave. And so I, I was a student at the time, so I really didn't have uh, many of my own finances. So I applied for another scholarship to come back and do more research. And I did that through Fulbright. And while I was doing research with my Fulbright, I applied for a PhD scholarship. So when I mentioned research, that is also in entomology and in insects but it's typically relating to, um, or what more, more of my formal studies are typically relating to sustainable pest control and agriculture. So we have something called biocontrol where we'll use insects um, to manage uh, pestilent insects in agriculture. And that can spare us from using really harmful chemical insecticides. It's a little more complex than that, but that's the gist of it. So I've worked with a lot of different vegetable crops and I worked with macadamia orchards throughout the um, course of a study. But what I'll present um, today are more my insect hobbies, which I was able to pursue a lot more because I was living in Australia and not only Australia, but uh, a, a more tropical or subtropical environment. And um, the, uh, I should mention too that I'm currently a PhD student still and I'm with the University of Queensland um, which is a fantastic university. Um, and this photo here is from my room and I'm holding a stick and uh, attached to that stick is a stick insect called the Titan stick insect. So it's an example of something I found in my backyard and was able to raise over several months to see its adult form um, appear. And I just, I, I didn't get the these same opportunities here in Arkansas. So I was very happy to be able to do this. 
So I live in Brisbane, Australia, which is part of Queensland. And there's, you may, when you think of Australia, you may think of kangaroos. We also have tree kangaroos um, in North Queensland. We also have dinosaurs essentially with our, our cassowaries. And so I knew a bit about these larger animals and, and how strange they were. And so some of my original motivation with coming to Australia in the first place is I knew how weird the big animals were. I knew that the insects must be extra weird as well. And they are. So also in, in um, Queensland, and there's the yellow arrow there pointing out where I'm living. So I'm living in the, a subtropical environment presently. Um, and I first came to the tropics, um, so the dark green sections in North Queensland. Um, there was this remarkable diversity and I, I found myself not, I didn't always need to collect things. Sometimes I would collect things if I was studying them, but many times I'm in a protected area and I don't have the right equipment. I don't need to collect, but I can take a photograph. And so photography started to become a more of an interest for me and a very useful tool for documenting things that I saw. And um, some of the examples of really extraordinary insects that we saw here and that I got to that I got to work with are the gargantuan stick insect. Um, so this is the longest stick insect in Australia. It's 139 centimeters, um, which is four and a half feet long. There may be some children you know that are that big, um, or young toddlers. Um, but this stick insect is it's fairly recent that the, it was found. Um, and so there's there's extraordinary, wonderful things like this that um, uh, in some cases are yet to be discovered or, or fully understood. And um, in this case, we were we had uh, I was working with a couple that had gotten eggs of the gargantuan stick insect and had finally, after one year, raised um, adults uh, of these uh, the, from these eggs. And so it was the first time that they were able to raise this stick insect in captivity. Um, and that is just going back to the Titan stick insect, which I showed you an example of. Um, that's the second longest. And then we have the third longest, the Goliath. So you may imagine how we're running out of, of names. And so if we find anything that's longer or larger, I don't know what we'll be able to call it commonly next. Um, so this love of insects, which I, I hope is apparent to you, I, I, I was able to document things um, with photographs, and I, I've really expanded that documentation by doing more proper macro photography. And by proper, I mean uh, higher quality images rather than just using my phone and a, um, a little lens, which, which can work pretty well. So the camera that I use, which I'm often asked, um, it, it's a Sony Alpha 6000. And then the key thing with any macro photography is light. So your camera doesn't matter as much as light matters. So I use a flash with the diffuser to evenly spread that light. And um, in this case, I don't even use a proper macro lens on that camera. I just use something called extension tubes, which are cheap. So it's a very cheap setup. And um, it was only fairly recently, so in 2019, that I was able to start photographing things properly. But I spent a lot of that time beforehand getting good at finding things. So being able to take good photographs is one thing. Being able to find things to photograph is another. So you can build these skills um, depending on what you have available to you. And um, by, by doing macro photography and doing um, research, I've been sharing these insect observations. So I do lots of outreach events in Australia, often for kids. Um, or, or talks, often for adults and other nature nerds, um, and I'm parts of uh, a part of societies. Um, so we have a, a big group of insect nerds called the Entomological Society of Queensland, which I'm I'm very happy to be a part of, and I've made lots of of great entomology friends from many of which are in their 80s, but they have so much knowledge to 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 share with me, and. Um, throughout this time, I've been sharing my macro photography on Instagram, and this is actually the platform where Australian Geographic found me, and um, it was actually their editor for Australian Geographic Explorers, so that's a kids magazine. They found this macro photography and then that I shared on Instagram, but I also, I will not only say what the insect is in a photograph, but I'll say a little bit about its life, and I do research on, on that species um, to say a little bit about what we've studied on it, what we know about it, and I emphasize their lives. And so you have to know that 
with Australian Geographic, that's the perfect situation for them. They have someone who can do the photographs, someone who has degrees in the subject, and someone who can do the research and writing for a broad audience, because that's what I was doing here on Instagram. And so this sort of hobby that I was doing off to the side for fun um, and not really doing for anyone but myself, um, it, it, it built some skills in, in communication. It also allowed me to um, more properly go, go through my photos and identify things. Um, and, and so when they asked me about if I'd be interested in, in putting together a book, because yes, they, they asked me if I was interested in doing an insect book, um, I was ready. And so that's how it was possible for me to put together Australia's Incredible Insects. And I have to say the hardest part was choosing what to keep in there because it's only 112 pages um, and I could easily have filled uh, 300. So this book itself, um, it focuses on insects in Australia. So not only things that are um, um, endemic there, so only found there, um, but also just present there. So introduced, we have invasives. Um, we have things that were purposefully introduced for things like biocontrol, which I study. And um, my, for my, um, my, the things that I wanted to include for this book were species that were rare or some sort of record breaker in, in weight or a length of, of size and some things that had an interesting life history or um, their sort of their ecology. And I really wanted to um, include things that were representative of different groups. So you can see some uh, an insect in the book that might be that might be common, so you might be able to find it, or you might be able to find something like it. So I um, have common names, which are the big titles in each book, but there's always scientific names, and that scientific name is your key to more information. And so, the book itself covers 253 different species. It has a basic introduction to entomology about what is an insect and, and classification and insect life cycles. Um, and then the rest of the book is basically split up into different groups of insects and everything is explained. Um, I do use some technical terms, but they're always defined. And um, I think it's really important that the, this sort of text um, and this book is different from a field guide because it emphasizes the lives and peculiarities about these insects. And the text is quite short, but you have that scientific name if you want to look up more. And there's lots of photos so you can, um, I, I've found that kids of all ages can enjoy these books. So um, on the right, there's some kids in kindergarten who have gone out and found a lady beetle that they have in their hand and they're looking at lady beetles in the book and they can make that connection. And um, in this case, they have an adult who can read a bit of the text and tell them a quick fact about them. And I, that was not my target age when I wrote this book, but they're using it and enjoying it. And then there's older people in, who are able to read it and enjoy it. And it's just been, it, it's had this life of its own. It's, it came out in late May and the book, I realize it, it's, it's probably the best thing I've done with my life. Um, so if you're thinking about putting together something that will outlive you essentially, do it because it, it's been an incredibly rewarding experience. So I'd like to share a few of the special insects um, of Australia and I'll include some equivalents here in Arkansas. And one of my favorites when I first came to Australia was the rainbow stag beetle. I couldn't believe something like this existed. It literally has different rainbow colors in its um, elytra. So those are hardened um, fore wings or front wings. And um, it's really difficult to photograph and capture all those colors, but we played around and captured that. So it is a stag beetle and stag beetles, as you may know, the males will have large mandibles or jaws. And so they can use that to fight with other males to access females or to access areas where females may come either to lay eggs or to feed on sap flows. Now these beetles can live for multiple years sort of like a human baby, their larvae take about nine months to develop. And then, so they live in rotten logs. So they spend most of their life in the dark and they will feed on white rot fungus that breaks down the cellulose in logs. And 
Um, they'll then pupate in there once they've gotten large enough, and then they'll emerge as adults. So this beautiful creature that's so rainbow colored is rarely even seen in the light. Um, and the adults can live for um, a couple of years as well. So a similar one is the golden stag beetle. So that's found within a broader range than the rainbow stag beetle and is a little more common. And um, beetles, all beetles have a complete or holometabolous life cycle. So they start with that egg laid in a rotten log with the sky too. Um, that egg hatches into a larva, which is sort of like a caterpillar or a beetle larvae are often called grubs. And then that will pupate and form into an adult. And so this life cycle, you may be more familiar with butterflies having this life cycle, but also flies, they have maggots for larvae. Ants, bees, and wasps also have a complete life cycle. And most of the diversity of insects that we see um, have this complete life cycle. And it allows them to occupy different uh, ecological niches or different habitats for different parts of their life. And so that has allowed them to diversify, or that's one of the main hypotheses as to why they are so diverse. But there's another life cycle um, that insects have, which I'll actually get to. So, um, oh, here's, uh, I should mention the uh, Arkansas equivalent of the stag beetle. So this is a giant stag beetle that you may find in Arkansas. You'd be quite lucky if you do see one. They're typically in really healthy habitats. You'll see them in summer. Um, so they're quite rare, and the males have these incredibly large mandibles to fight for females, much like the, the deer that you see um, fighting with each other. So you, it's not hard to imagine what they use those jaws for. And yes, I have found them, and they do pinch you quite hard with those mandibles. So be careful if you do find one, you'll get pinched. So the other life cycle um, that insects have is a, an incomplete life cycle. So we see this here with a, an Australian dancing leaf insect. Um, and so they uh, start their lives out as an egg and that hatches into nymphs, um, which eventually become adults. So the nymph looks like a small version of the adult just lacking wings. And um, nymphs have several different instars. So you see life stage one, two, three, up to seven for this in this case. And um, you'll also see there's lots of leaf insects here. They kind of split off. So with the dancing leaf insect, the females um, are large and more leaf-like, whereas the males have longer antennae. They have long wings. They're more thin-bodied. They can fly, but the adult females cannot fly. They just need to be camouflaged and um, eat and look like what they, uh, they eat. So Females with many stick insects, they can uh, lay eggs and then they'll hatch, so they don't actually have to mate. But males in this case need to go out and find females and mate with them so they can pass on their genes or their genetic information and um, continue their lineage. Um, and so that's why you see these different adaptations with the females and the males, and it's really um, quite divergent because females, their goal is only to lay as many eggs as they can. And to do that, they need to be uh, nice and fat so they can lay more eggs um, and also live longer so they can lay more eggs. Whereas the males, um, it's all about finding that female and they have a shorter life um, as well. So that's one example. And these are all photographs that I was able to compile by keeping these leaf insects and, and raising them. And I've actually, published a paper with um, some collaborators. So Royce Cumming is, um, he's in the States, actually in California um, at the moment, um, but he's doing a degree in New York. So he's a bit in two different places all the time. And so he realized uh, while working on their taxonomy or their like sort of uh, species status, that um, this genus uh, of leaf insects in Australia and, and that which we find in New Guinea, which is an island just um, north of Australia, those insect leaf insects are um, part of a unique group. So we used to call them philium, which means leaf-like, um, but we realized they needed a new name essentially and, an, and a new updated description. So I worked with him on that and got to name this leaf insect Walla philium and walla comes from 
a couple of different indigenous terms, um, which mean to dance, but also to be hidden. And so it's the dancing but hidden leaf insect, uh, Wallophilium. And Monteithi um, was named um, after a friend of mine, Jeff Monteith, who helped out some other scientists who studied this leaf insect. So another example of some really extraordinary um, insects that we have in Australia are the birdwing butterflies. And these guys are really common. Um, they're kind of like, it, 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 it's, it's really extraordinary to see such a big butterfly. Um, I have scale bars at the bottom, which are uh, one centimeter long to give you an idea of how big they are. Um, but this species is sexually dimorphic. So we have um, the two sexes being two different forms. Um, so the female is on the left and she is pretty drab, whereas the males are re really vibrantly colored. And I, I, I like to compare these to the birds of paradise, if you've ever seen them. So there's really flashy males that will dance um, to court a female, which is typically more drably colored, more camouflaged. Um, in this case, this particular species is actually a little bit toxic. So she has yellow and red warning of um, predators of her toxicity, but otherwise she's kind of hidden away. Whereas the males, they need to be flashy. They will actually dance around a freshly emerged female. So she'll come out of her pupil case and a male is there. He's smelled her out. He's flying above and below her and he's sort of um, peppering her with some of his pheromones to coax her into mating. And the Cam's bird wing is toxic. So they gain their toxicity um, uh, when they're caterpillars, so in their larval stage, and they'll feed on Peristolochia and Aristolochia vines. Um, and we have some similar uh, vines here in America. Um, and so they have these sort of warning colors um, telling predators, don't eat me, I'm toxic. And they're actually able to carry those toxins on into their adult stage, um, which tells predators, hey, don't eat me. And they can learn that signal pretty quickly. They have another defense um, um, that they can inflate. So if you tap on them, they'll inflate these. They look like, it looks like a forked snake tongue um, and it can smell and it's called an osmaterium. So this inflatable defense is found in any, uh, any member of the family Papillionidae. So there's um, orchard swallowtails um, and some other examples that will meet. So the pipe vine swallowtail is one of the Arkansas equivalents. So this is something that occurs in more states than just Arkansas, but um, something that I've actually been seeing quite a lot of here while uh, in, during my short stay so far. And they too, as caterpillars, will feed on the toxic Peristolochia vines. Um, and so then their adults are, are toxic as well. And in this case, this has actually led to them having many mimics here. So within the range of this um, butterfly, there's some unique mimics. And some mimics of the pipe vine swallowtail, personal favorite of mine is the red spotted purple. So on the right in the green boxes are our template. That's the, the true toxic pipe vine swallowtail butterfly, but we have our mimics on the left. And everything on the left is the same species. So we have the white admiral, um, which is a butterfly um, and a common name for a butterfly that they find in northern states where the pipe vine swallowtail does not occur. And then we have red spotted purple, which occurs here. And they look quite different. So what's happening is in the areas where the um, this species of butterfly co-occurs with the pipe vine swallowtail, it, it actually mimics the pipe vine swallowtail and it has a totally different form um, in other states. And it's kind of a, a it's not that great of a mimic. If you, you're looking at these photos, you'll be able to tell some differences. An obvious one is it lacks those little tails at the end um, of, of the hind wings. Um, and so this is a case of how important it is to have these scientific names. I know they can be hard to remember, but um, the scientific names can allow you to connect these two different color forms of the same species. In this case, they are different subspecies, which is a whole nother topic, but 
don't worry about it too much. But those scientific names allow you to know what is closely related and what's an example of something that has had convergent evolution or arrived at the same body form or appearance, but has taken a different path. And another example of mimicry of the pipe vine swallowtail is the eastern tiger swallowtail. And this one is actually really interesting for different reasons. So this, these photos are the same species and they're both females of the eastern tiger swallowtail, Papilio glaucus. And so this uh, swallowtail butterfly actually occurs over a broader range, but where it overlaps with the pipe vine swallowtail, you get these dark form females that are more so mimics of the pipe vine swallowtail. Now, in this case, you can't use the little tails on the hind wings to differentiate them. Instead, I, I would rely more on how iridescently blue the hind wings are to give you a sort of idea. Now, this is interesting because most uh, both forms are maintained in this species, so they can be yellow or they can be dark. And this is because the males, we think have a hard time identifying or they probably prefer the yellow females. They look more similar to the males. And so the males are able to say, yes, you're the same species, I'll mate with you. Um, whereas the dark forms, they don't, they look a little bit different. They're like, are you, should we hook up? I don't know. Yeah, so that's a, that's a really cool example of this different form that has popped up over time. Um, and it's all about mimicry with the um, pipe vine swallowtail. And I'll tell you another rule with mimicry is that the pipe vine swallowtail needs to be more abundant than the mimics. So the mimics um, are giving out this false signal. They're not toxic. So if a, a predator comes to eat them, they, um, they, they might think, oh, I can eat that. And then, um, and then they'll eat all the other mimics. But if most of the representatives out there are toxic, predators can come in. They end up, may end up eating one of the toxic ones and they maybe vomited it up and they say, oh, right, I'm never eating that again. And they learn that, that visual signal of the appearance. And so that adds this sort of selective pressure that acts on the population that gives us these forms that we see today. It's a very general form of describing that all, but yeah. So going back to Australia, we have some extraordinarily wonderful moths. So we've moved away from our, our day flying Lepidoptera butterflies. So uh, we have the Hercules moth, which is, um, the largest moth in the world by wing area. It's the females that are larger than the males. Um, and so in sort of similar to the stick insects that I told you about, females need to lay as many eggs as possible. So it's great for them to be really large. And in this case, they have really large wings to cope with their heavy bodies and um, provide them with some different camouflage. When you see them uh, flying, it, it actually sounds like a bat. When I first saw one, I thought it was literally a bat. Um, they're that large. And many people think that atlas moths are the biggest one. And there's a photo of one there below. And atlas moths are found in, in Southeast Asia. And they're extraordinary and they're large and they're wonderful. Um, but they're the second largest by wing area. So Hercules moth holds that title. And the adults of the Hercules moth have no mouth and they don't live for very long. So they live on some stored body fats that they gain in their caterpillar stage. And then the goal is just to mate and lay eggs and it doesn't take too long to do that. So hopefully they live long enough um, as in they don't get eaten by anything um, so they can mate and uh, reproduce. And similar, a similar story here in Arkansas, we have the Luna moth and adults of the Luna moth have no mouth so they don't live for very long and you don't usually see them very often. Um, so, that makes them a little, a little bit of a special treat. And this was one of my favorite insects when I was growing up here. And their um, caterpillars will feed all summer. They can have multiple generations a year, but they usually will feed all summer around this time of year. And then once they get fat enough, they will pupate. And they, the, the larva the, or the caterpillar makes a silken case out of leaves. And then it's really protected in that silken case. And, and once it's inside there, it will shed its larval skin 
and this pupa will form. So this pupa um, on the left is usually what you might find in the leaf litter or still on the tree. Um, and then if you were able to cut it open, that's what you would find inside. And that pupil case is actually so hard for them to, um, for anything to cut open or get into that once, once winter has passed and you know the, the next spring has come out and it's warm enough, this pupa will emerge as an adult, but when it does, it secretes a sort of digestive fluid that makes the silk weaker so they can then cut their way out to emerge. So it's quite extraordinary that they have all these adaptations. They've been in their sleeping bag all winter and then they have to sort of dissolve it to get out. And I really love moths. I've gotten to study a lot of them with uh, my PhD, and but also on the side. And one of the my favorite ones is the giant wood moth in Australia. Um, and so this wood moth actually made it into the news here in America as well. You may have seen uh, this news story, which is from last year, giant wood moth, very heavy insect, rarely seen by humans, spotted at an Australian school. And it is the heaviest moth in the world with the record female weighing 31.2 grams. I'm not sure how many ounces or pounds that is, I'm sorry. Um, and it is actually, this species is very widespread throughout the east coast of Australia and it's abundant. It, it is common in parks. It's common in some people's backyards um, and it can live for two to three years. But yes, the adults are very rarely seen and that's because most of their life is spent in their larval stage. So what I have circled here is their smaller caterpillars and how over that two to three years, they grow into this really large, juicy um, caterpillar, which kind of looks like a beetle larvae. So they're sometimes called a grub or a witchetty grub because indigenous Australians would eat this larval stage. And I'm told, I haven't eaten them because I love them myself, but I'm told that they taste like um, cheesy eggs and are best served when cooked in hot ashes. So the life of the giant wood moth, I, I've actually studied this a bit and, and recently published a paper. Um, so they lay these large masses of eggs. They're so heavy. Um, they don't, the adults don't have mouths, they're just eggs. And so the females will lay these masses of eggs and those will soon hatch out to these tiny little larvae that you can kind of see specks of in this photo and you see all the silk. Um, you may know spiders will silk disperse like that and these caterpillars are doing the same thing. And then no one really knows what happens. So they hatch out in their, um, their 2.5 millimeters. So they're extraordinarily small and then we don't see them again until they are 25 millimeters long. And this is when um, here in this figure, you'll see A in this small striped caterpillar, it's first boring into a tree. So they actually will tunnel into the tree um, and excavate that and have a little silken covering over the entrance at first. Um, and they'll what they're doing in there is they're making a protective chamber that they um, expand over time to live in and, and um, sort of um, retreat from predators um, or harsh temperatures from. In, inside the tree. Um, but what they're feeding on is not the wood of the tree. What they're feeding on is the regenerative tissue just under the bark called the cambium. And this is a really nutritious um, material for them to eat because it's the living tissue of the tree and they're able to get all the nutrients that they need um, and be sheltered. And this is how they're able to live for so long. So that retreating chamber, which is more vertical, um, is expanded over time because they are becoming a really juicy meal and uh, larger predators are, are more likely to come and get them and they're capable of building these larger retreating chambers. And so by the time um, it's lost its stripes and it's gotten quite nice and juicy, um, it has a really large feeding area and it has multiple sections. Um, but this caterpillar is large enough, it's ready to pupate. And it does a couple of things um, when it is getting ready to pupate. So it doesn't need to feed anymore. So it will now cut holes um, inside of the, the tree. So it's it's cut a, um, a, a drainage hole at the bottom, which is where it initially came into. And it's cut a larger um, exit hole, which it may line with some sort of loose 
um, silk and wood strips that it's it's pulled out of the tree. It then backs into that original um, retreating chamber and lines it with this mucilaginous sticky webbing and then plugs itself off in that chamber and it will shed its larval skin and pupate and it's safe inside there. So the pupal stage is really vulnerable to any sort of predators. It can't really defend itself. When it's a caterpillar, it can at least vomit and make itself look gross or, or crawl away. A pupa can only wiggle. It can't really do much. So this caterpillar in a way has thought ahead um, to protect itself. Um, but really these are, it, I shouldn't anthropomorphize them too much, but we, we can talk about that later, I guess. Um, so once the, the pupa, it'll be a pupa for about 60 days. And then once it's ready to emerge, it has a sort of horn on its uh, head of the pupa. And like a can opener, it's able to remove that plug, push through the silken webbing, push out of that exit hole, and then that head case comes uh, out off and the pupil case splits out and the adult emerges, crawls onto the tree and inflates its wings. And the, the adults are extraordinarily large. They, you may think that's not very beautiful, but they blend in with the gray bark of eucalyptus trees that they usually bore into. And so I've, I've spent a lot of time um, studying these moths and I recently published this big paper on them. So if you're interested in reading more about them, I, I did publish this um, in a way where it's freely available. It's open access to anyone. If you just Google Beyond the Pest, um, or this title um, or my name, you should be able to find it for free. Um, and these photos, you can see the caterpillars in my hands. Um, you have to chisel them out of the tree. So I've gotten good with a chisel and a mallet um, to excavate these caterpillars intact and learn more about exactly what's happening inside of the tree. I mean, you can always detect them from outside of the tree as well. There's clear signs. Um, so here I'm standing next to a tree with two clear um, wood moth tunnels. They have that characteristic large hole and little hole below it. So you can see those two there. So look for that if you ever come over to visit Australia. Another giant that we have in Australia are our giant burrowing cockroaches. And you may say, yuck, wow, I'm so happy I live in Arkansas and I don't have to deal with these, but they're really cute. You should come for just for these cockroaches. They're the heaviest cockroach in the world, which is wonderful. Um, they actually give live birth, which is very unique among insects. Most insects lay eggs, but these cockroaches actually give birth to about 15 to 30 nymphs. And the females will take care of those babies for up to a year. So they're really good moms. And they live in sand. So you actually would, it's, it can be quite hard to um, see them. But if um, it's, you get a heavy downpour and it's summertime, which is around December in Australia, um, a lot of the males will come to the surface. Um, and they're usually searching out females at this point. And so you can see a photo of my partner, Andrew, he's found a wandering male of this giant cockroach out in a rainstorm. So it's, it, it was quite a nice day for us. I, I don't know if that's what you guys would call fun, but um, I promise it is fun. Um, so we don't really have giant cockroaches here. So I thought of another really weird insect that I could feature from here, um, here in Arkansas is the giant or e also called the Eastern Dobson fly. Um, and this, these guys uh, spend most of their life as larvae, so they'll live in really healthy streams, um, and they're predators in the, in the streams, and a lot of people will commonly call them helgramites. So they feed on a lot of other um, aquatic invertebrates there. And then they um, will emerge as adults, and you may see these guys, uh, they, well, I should actually back up. So they spend their larval stage in the water. They actually come out of the water to pupate. Um, and then pretty shortly, they will emerge as an adult from their pupal stage. These guys are really um, bizarre, but they're more of an ancestral form of insect. So if you're meant to, if you were able to time travel um, a million years back, you may see insects that look more similar to this. Um, so, they are also sexually dimorphic. So you have males with really large um, mandibles. They actually use that to hold the female in place and coax her into mating. 
um, um, and they can pinch you, but it's more more so that the females with their jaws, um, they will actually bite you pretty good. I, and I, I may be speaking from experience. Um, and they often come to your porch lights, so maybe you guys have seen them before. Just know that they're quite special. We do have some dobs and flies in Australia, but they're tiny and they're rare. So you're really lucky to have these guys commonly. So if you're interested in more insects that are record breakers, there are some great books. The, um, the book that's actually quite scientific with images of the insects that are um, put to their actual size, life size, um, is you can find that in Big Bugs Life Size by George Beccoloni. And he actually came over to Australia, met Jeff Monteith. They're admiring a giant wood moth caterpillar. Um, and Jeff is the other one who's taught me originally or, or converted me to studying wood moths um, as well. So there's there's plenty of great insects in there and they're from all over the world. And those are all the record holders with information on the back saying exactly how much they weigh um, and where the specimen is in case you find something that may break that record. So Arkansas has wonderful insects as well. You may be already familiar with um, this field guide um, to insects of North America. It's a pretty classic one. It's a good go-to um, book for identifying some of the insects that you find. Um, but the identity of something is just the start. So you wanna learn a little bit more information about them and you can use that scientific name to be your key to more information. Um, and another book that's pretty fantastic is 100 Insects of Arkansas in the Mid-South. So that's um, a, pub a local publication um, and that covers a lot of the species that you should find here. Um, and, and in some cases it's quite broad to be um, whole groups, like whole families of insects that you may see. And, and it really emphasizes the lives uh, of them. And of course, if you're interested in Insects of Australia, <laughs> there are other books, um, but I, I put together Australia's Incredible Insects to emphasize a lot of the things that are really special in Australia and um, introduce readers to entomology and um, also teach some pretty broad lessons about the importance of studying insects, whether it's for pollination or pest control or or managing invasive, invasive threats for biosecurity, which is a really um, important aspect of uh, in Australia, because we're quite susceptible to um, invasive pests ruining our, our beautiful native uh, flora, flora and fauna. And I'd like to, to leave off on um, this piece of art that was put together by Frederick Parkhurst Dodd, who was originally a banker, but then became an entomologist, sort of discovered entomology. And, um, and is also known as the Butterfly Man of Coranda for what he's contributed to entomology, but also teaching the public about how special the insects in Australia are. And this quote that he found particularly um, important that he um, spelled it out in, with butterflies um, goes saying, and whenever the way seemed long or his heart began to fail, she being nature, would sing a more wonderful song or tell a more marvelous tale. So I think um, I can speak to Dodd's uh, point and Longfellow's points. This is a quote from a poem about how wonderful it is to study nature. Um, and you can study at all different levels. You don't need to have a degree in the subject. Just going out um, can be quite healing or, um, or quite, um, quite wonderful and, and peaceful. And um, you may discover something quite extraordinary along the way. So with all that said, I, I'd like to thank you for listening to me for so long and take any questions that you have. And I do have books uh, for sale on my website if you're interested. Great, thanks. Well, Jessa, thank you for sharing that. That was amazing. Um, and you covered a lot of the questions I was going to ask already, but oh, no. <laughs> no, that's a good thing. It saves us some time because we did get some from the audience and uh, I'll do a final call for the audience if you do have any questions please ask away live so you'll have a chance to win a copy of Jessa's book right here for, to pick up at the library. Um, but you, for, in your presentation, you um, did kind of, you started with your younger years in high school, but when did you first discover your love for insects? Um, it, it did, a lot of people talk about it being one moment, but I, I think it just was sort of gradual over time. And I, I think 
I, I, I had already started to like insects and become interested in it by uh, doing this course and actually collect, I was collecting them uh, for the class itself, but it made me go outside and watch them and pay attention. And just that act of being out in nature and, and taking that time to get outside of myself, I found it uh, so like, it's such a relief um, from anything else that I may be worried about. Um, I, and I just realized there's so much more to life. And so that's when I, I, I kind of had that sort of moment being out in, in nature and, and realized, gosh, there's so much more to life. How wonderful is this? And so uh, I have to study this in some way. So that's the sort of moment, I guess. So at what point did you realize this was something you want to make a career out of? Oh, I, I, once I realized you could make a career out of it, I didn't know. I had, I remember Googling what entomology was when I was 18. So I, I just hadn't been properly introduced. I, and so it's that matter of exposure and having a good teacher. So I was, mm -hmm. yeah, I was 18, which sounds, I felt quite old at the time, but it's, it's young to me now. <laughs> So you're just knowing you personally, we were just a couple of grades apart. I know you did very well in high school and you were a valedictorian of your class and all that. But once you had had a focus on entomology, did that make it harder to do well in your classes that had nothing to do with arthropods? Uh, no, no, I, I still have my other interests. Yeah, so I think, I think you, it's easier for us to classify people into one, liking one thing, mm -hmm. um, but every, everyone's different and diverse. And so I, I still maintained all those interests. And it, the great thing is seeing how my time at the library, my interest in writing, my interest in art, and I mean, people may think that uh, macro photography is an art, but I feel differently. It all converged. So it all came together to put this book together. Wonderful. Um, have you, here's a softball, but have you faced any judgment being a, a woman who has an interest in a career in nature and insects that you think is a unique experience? If, if anything, I feel like I've had a, a privilege because of the time that I've been, that I'm living in, people are more encouraging for um, diversity. So they see a young woman who's interested and they like to encourage that. A lot of people will say, aren't you scared? Uh, right. You're so, so brave to go out because I'll go night hiking by myself. Or I used to. I have a partner who likes to come with me now. But um, yeah, and I, I, I thought, oh, there are some more dangers, I guess, that women will face. And so that I felt like that was a limitation at first. Um, but I, I thought I'd rather take the risk and live that life. Um, <laughs> And, and I've, it, it's been fine, honestly. Yeah. Right. The stereotype, you know, is, ew, bugs. But to me, I feel like I know more men who are, are that way <laughs> and, and, and less uh, brave when it comes to that. So, um, yeah, I should note too, Australia has been really, um, I've never really felt judged because I'm a girl uh, in Australia. I, I think it, there is a little bit of a different culture here where there's a little bit more like, Oh, you! I'm, you're gonna get dirty, or why do you like that? But I, I don't experience that in Australia. It's no question. They're just like, oh, and what does this do? They'll just ask more questions about what what's happening. Wonderful. Yeah. So, does Australian Geographic have any affiliation with the National Geographic Society? No, they're totally different. Yeah, it was actually started by this um, man who made. I should remember his name. <laughs> Dick, Dick Smith, is it? Yeah, yeah. His name is so common, Dick Smith. So he um, actually made a lot of money selling electronics. Um, and then he was such a, a little bush baby that he liked to go out hiking and exploring. And he realized, I want to fund projects like this. And so that's how Australian Geographic got started. So when you go out into the field to work with the wildlife, are, are there any regulations that are specific to Australia or just in general that you have to follow? Oh yeah, yeah. So a great development we've had is a, a lot of land has gone back to traditional custodians. And so that was a little hectic at first because we were like, uh, here you have native title and or um, and then some in some cases it, the permits moved over to traditional custodians and they're like, I, I don't know what to do with this. You know, there used to be one one sort of system and now there's a few different kinds. So there's 
um, there's been a lot more negotiations and, and it, it just takes time with this relationship building. So it was a little bit hectic at first because it was this big change, um, but it's been a good change. And um, so that's one part. Uh, you may have to apply for a permit to collect in some area and you have to bring some if some of the you have to uh, apply for permission from the traditional owners and then they may want to come with you. So you have to have a spare seat in your car. <laughs> Uh, what was the most challenging part of taking off and launching your book? Oh my God, time. They just yeah. didn't, yeah. And because I'm doing a PhD, so I I thought about this for a long time. I thought, I do not have the time. I should not do this. But I thought, I cannot turn this down because they wanted me to do this book. So I asked my supervisor, actually, and he said, do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm at the end of my PhD. I feel like I could have been, I, I, it's hard to say, but I feel like maybe I could have been done by now, but uh, maybe I couldn't have, honestly, probably couldn't have, <laughs> knowing some of the other things I had to go, get through. So mainly time, because I had six months to do the book. Now, you might have mentioned this in your presentation, so sorry if I missed it, but the cover is just gorgeous. So who, who was, who did the design for this? Uh, so I did the most, there's a couple of photographs that aren't mine on that, but most of those are my own and I sent them a layout and then they actually have designers that do the final version. Mm -hmm. So my original layout was everything was proportional to one another in life size. So there's some things that are usually really small that are made really big and some things that are really big that are made really small. So they, no, sorry, <laughs> not, not to scale. Great, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm more technical, so it was good to have a designer. They they do have an official designer that is like, all oh, right. But but you got but, to choose the placement yeah. of where each insect went. Yeah. Great. So we had to meet in the middle in many places. So I'm thinking science, very you know rigid, and then they're like, make it fun. <laughs> <laughs> was there anything that was almost excluded to just trim it down that you were like, no, that has to be in there? Oh, the whole book could have been on wood moths. <laughs> In the wood moth, oh, I send them so many things and they just put in one little photo of it. I, yeah, I really like them. <laughs> so there's going to have to be a extended second edition. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, let's look at our viewer questions. Um, let's see. Jessamine says, um, what is, in your opinion, the prettiest insect you've got to interact with in person? Gosh, actually, it's probably it's the one on the cover. It's called um, Spilopyra sumptuosa is the scientific name, which I think is quite nice. Sumptuous. Which one is that? It's the rainbow leaf beetle. It's the one on the leaf. Oh, right here. Yeah, right here next to your finger. Yeah, that one is so stunning. And they're usually found in rainforests and they're usually on the undersides of leaves. So they're really dark. But if you get them into the light, it's just stunning. And I feel like I feel like it kind of captures it in the photo, but it's just another thing to see it in person. It's just stunning. And what is that insect behind you? Oh, yes. <laughs> this is uh, another example of a good mom. There's lots of bugs, true bugs that are good moms. So this is a, oh, I had to make up a common name for it, but it's called Stelita in Decora. <laughs> Um, so she's standing, she's actually been standing guards o over her eggs. So she had about 30 eggs that she was standing over for, I think it was two weeks. And this is in our backyard. And then those uh, babies that hatch out are nymphs. So they have all hatched out and she's still standing guard over them. They're not <coughs> old enough to, they, they're, they have a proboscis or uh a stink bug. <laughs> They're a stink bug. I should just say that. Sorry, I get caught up with scientific names. They're very useful, but yeah. Um, so she's standing guard over all of her newly hatched babies, and they're too young to feed on their own. And so she's sort of standing guard. And once they get old enough, she's like, bye. <laughs> I'm going to go do my own thing. And they disperse too. We have uh, quite a few questions from Belinda. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> first of all, uh, do you have a peppermint stick insect? Oh, I did. I had, <laughs> <laughs> I had, I had, I got one. I called her Peppy, and I got her. I got one in 2018, and I was on the sixth parthenogenetic population. So, 
So it was a female that laid eggs and then those eggs are not fertilized. So they all hatched out into more females or clones. And so I had those and I got through six generations. And so I only have eggs right now. Um, but yeah, I've, I've always have peppies as I like to call them. Uh, she also asked what do the gargantuan sticks eat? Ah, uh, we actually were feeding them on eucalyptus, but we don't know what else they may feed on. It's actually, so very little of their lives are known. So it, by finding that they actually, by get, being able to raise it in captivity, that's your opportunity to learn more about its life. And that's what happened here. And they only got eggs because a bird was eating one in their backyard <laughs> and they were able to dissect out eggs and then those thankfully hatched. So very little is known, yeah. Eucalyptus is the plant that we that works so far. And then, uh, do you know the She's Got Legs photographer? I've not met her, but her parents, so her parents are the ones that had the stick and sticks, the Hendersons. Yeah. Uh, a couple more from Jessamine. <clears throat> My six-year-old is asking, what's the fattest bug you've ever studied? Oh, the giant wood moth. <laughs> They're all eggs. They're all eggs inside. So I had an adult female and I kept her. And she laid all of her eggs, and then she weighed nothing. <laughs> she is so very fat. What are common predators for a Hercules moth? Birds, yeah, or a tasty meal for any bird. Or um, I don't think any bats will get them. They're usually active at night. But yeah, birds and honestly anything that can catch it. So we have lots of uh, dragons. They're reptiles uh, that can eat them. So let's get a couple more in. Uh, nice comment from Michaela who says, Jessa, you are so impressive. Love hearing you share and look forward to reading your new book with my little girls. Oh, also. thank you. That's so sweet. <laughs> and then uh, she also said, people are diverse. Love that truth. Um, another question from Belinda. Um, what are some of your favorite authors? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so for nonfiction, I, I was enjoying, uh, I, I, I enjoy the way that, um, Evelyn Cheeseman writes her books. So she wrote quite a few books, um, in the 1930s. She was the first female that worked in the insect collection or insect zoo in, um, in England. And then she got to go on these extraordinary trips to New Guinea. And so I was actually reading some of her books thinking I'll never go to New, New Guinea, and then I got to go and I just could think about her words um, ringing out true when I was out there. And then uh, another title, a, a fiction book, uh, Where the Crawdads Sing, Delia Owens, is, she wrote a great book. And I thought that was uh, a great book talking about this sort of relationship with nature. Yeah. So, yeah, when that came out, that was at the top of the library hold list. For, oh, really? Like, yeah. We must have had, a, you know, we yeah, had 20 something copies. And, and, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, let's do one more. Uh, we haven't got the Laura Lee. Uh, she says, what is the most wonderful rare specimen you have found? Uh, maybe this, I found a, a scale insect recently. <laughs> so it doesn't look like much of anything. The female looks like a blob. Uh, I look <laughs> like a blob now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, there's a thing called the bird of paradise fly that it's not a fly, it's a scale insect. Um, and so you more commonly see the males and they actually look like a fishing fly and they have red wings and they're just beautiful, this fluffy white bum. But then the females look like a blob. They live underground. They're very rare to see. And I finally recently saw a female crawling up a tree in winter, but a oh, little well, subtropical winter. So it's quite warm. You don't even need a jacket. Um, but crawling up a tree to beckon to the boys. And she was out there for three days. And then I saw the mating happen. And then I was out of uh, service then. And I go and research it because this isn't a group I usually study, but I knew about them and they're in my book. Um, but I realized the ah, species here is not described. And that's there was no record for that area, which is a unique, nice big sand island called Gari. Uh, so that was quite special. Yeah, that was a bit rare. <laughs> it looked like a candy. How's that? <laughs> Tempting. But yeah, I was tempted. I the, in scale insects actually, um, you can eat many of them because they are all sugary and and or fatty, and so they're quite yummy. 
Well, Timon and Pumbaa would be proud of you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there's a before we uh, choose a winner, there was a quick game I wanted to play with you. Okay. And um, <laughs> I am going to show you some insect memes, and I okay. want you to, to explain them, re review the meme. Um, so there's a popular Facebook group called into memeology yes i know that uh, one. <laughs> so uh look that up at your own risk it's not always family friendly but uh some of these were pulled from there so credits to to people in that group for making these but if you'll explain the meme for the audience <laughs> so this is talking about the 17 year cicada um so um, they spend, these cicadas um, will have a nymphal stage, so they spend most of their lives underground feeding. And so they're waiting for 17 years, so they're all in sync. Um, and they all emerge well, after 17 years, so they wake up, emerge from the ground, scream for four weeks. So they're calling um, really loudly, and they um, are all calling together. Um, and they actually, it actually works through some parts of their wing, uh, below their wings in their body. So it's not necessarily a vocal scream. Um, refuse to elaborate. So they just make this sort of the same call. It's actually a little bit different. Um, and then die. And so that this meme is talking about the life cycle. It's actually quite accurate <laughs> of, <laughs> of, um, of a 17 year cicada. So I can talk about how it's adaptive, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, so th this is a nice orchid mantis that's caught two flies at once. They maybe the flies are mating. Um, and yeah, it's just the position has worked out right to where they look like they're going to kiss. Oh, <laughs> so this uh, is actually a big, nice beetle, and um, those uh, we talked about stag beetles a bit. So males have these large um mandibles to fight each other with but maybe they will pinch you especially if you steal their girlfriend <laughs> you'll relate to this one I'm oh sure. yeah yeah we have them in our shower <laughs> <laughs> yes actually one of the first things i saw was one of these tarantula hawk wasps capturing the spider and i was like wow oh my gosh <laughs> yeah no, I don't know what would get the, um, a bird would get the wasp after this. <laughs> I love that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, in, insects are really attracted to lights often because insects at night will use the moon or any sort of light to sort of orient themselves. And so you turn on a light and then they're like, wow, that is amazing. I'm going to go there. And um, it's actually quite nice because you can light trap or turn on your lights and, and the insects will come to you, introduce themselves even. All right, one more. And uh, thank you to uh, Brett here at the library for sharing these. <laughs> I know, yes, this is great. I know how people hate bugs on land. I guess it's things that overlap with our space, but if they're in the water, they're delicious. If they're on land, they can be delicious too. It just depends on yeah. your culture. <laughs> um, have you been to the Audubon Insectarium in New Orleans? No, I've not. I've not been down there. No. Oh well, great food in general, but uh, at, not necessarily insectarium. But in New Orleans, great food. But we went there on vacation and we went to the insectarium, and they have a place where you can try insects, and you'll know, do like barbecue, crickets, and um, you know all, all kinds of diff different. They have a little place where you can sample them within the museum, and uh, it's not bad. I mean, yeah, they're quite. Don't knock it till you try it. How you cook yeah. it? Yeah, it can yeah. be quite good. Yeah, I've, I've tried the chirps, the cricket chips. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not saying it's probably an acquired taste. I didn't love it, but you know, it didn't make me sick. I was willing to eat more, so mm. I can see where people would enjoy it. It can be pretty delicious. So, yeah. I mean, especially, it's good to know, too, in Australia, there's so many bush foods and a lot of them are insects. <laughs> you have a little snack on your hike. Let's see. Brett says, I think I know where I'm going on my honeymoon. Is it to the insectarium or to Australia? <laughs> <Which one? laughs> yeah. Well, I'm a blob again. 
that's funny. Um, all right, well, let's pick our winner here. And I have everybody numbered off, but Jessa has not seen who is assigned what number. So I'm going to have you pick a number, one to six. My favorite number is four. Favorite number is four. And number four is Michaela. Oh, yay. You will be reading it. <laughs> so, Michaela, you have earned by commenting a copy of Australia's Incredible Insects. So, and it is signed by Jessica here. So, it's available for you to pick up at the library whenever you are ready. So, congratulations. Yay. And I've donated, I'm donating two copies of the book to the library. So th those will eventually be available for checkout. I don't know how long it takes to process, but yeah. Yep, well, we'll be sure to uh, r rush those for you so we can get those up there. And uh, be sure if, if you are interested, be sure to place a hold on a copy of Jess's book. Uh, it should be available in our system and in the near future for you to do so. All right. Well, thank you just so much for this program. It was so much fun and very informative. And Thanks for organizing it. Yeah, absolutely. So before we go, um, I'll let you uh, have the final word, share what you want to share. If there's anything else you want to promote or push, you are welcome to do so. Oh, I just, I guess, want to say there's, there's nothing really special about me. I think I've been quite lucky to find something that I was interested in and have really supportive people in my life. Um, and, and I've pursued these interests. It felt like a gamble at times. I felt, oh, how will I make money doing that? This is a good choice. But it's ultimately what I really enjoyed doing. And so it's all worked out. So I'd encourage you guys to do the same if you're interested in something. Um, yeah, you, you can you can pursue it, kind of trust the process, especially if you're interested in nature. There's there's different ways. There's there are jobs studying insects, for instance. Excellent, excellent. And where can they find your book if they want their own copy? It is, so I have my website, so you could buy it from me if you'd like, um, which is uh, jessathurman.com.au for Australia. Um, and I do have international shipping. Please note all the prices are in Australian dollars, which it, there's like, I think it's 70 cents on the US dollar. So it's it's cheaper than you think, wow. um, so you can convert it. Or I think it's I think it's sometimes available on Amazon, but I think that's been rare. Um, but yeah, wherever you can find it, um, if you want to buy it from me, I I do sign it, um, and I can yeah put in a special message if you'd like. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, oh, and while I'm thinking of it, Michaela, if, if case I'm not here when you get here, this will just be on my desk so you can ask someone at the front to grab it for you. But um, thank you, everyone, for watching. This was recorded, so if you tuned in late or you know someone who might be interested in watching this great presentation, please share it. It's on Facebook and YouTube, um, so be sure to share that. Thank you for watching, and everyone, take care. Thanks.